changes, pressures are going to be put on the church to change as well, to fit into society. Um, and we see this in the West happening uh, very, very quickly. And we just thought that to, to, to stop and say, hold on, what is it that is the foundation of our understanding of ourselves? Um, as a parish, as Christians, what is it that we stand for? Um, and so in talking to, to Jerry, he was saying, uh, and I think we need to look at what the Anglican Church, the official teaching of the Anglican Church is, because as an Anglican Church, people will very quickly say, oh, but the Anglicans this and the Anglicans that. And as I said on Sunday, you've got uh, respected, um, prominent Anglican bishops uh, in the West that are uh, uh, will deny all the miracles in the Bible, deny the virgin birth, deny the resurrection, uh, and claim it's all about how you feel and what it makes you feel spiritually. Um, and at the other extreme, you've got a number of bishops, equally grand and, and honorable um, in the third world, who say it's all absolutely literal. Um, and so to say we're Anglican, what does that actually mean? And so we, we're beginning to look over the next couple of weeks and what we say are the foundations of our faith and where we stand essentially as a parish. Um, and that's going to, uh, we're not going to try and define this is what Anglicanism is. We're going to leave the, that, there's a thousand different ideas of Anglicanism. And um, even in the Johannesburg Diocese, St. Luke's is a very low church parish. Um, we're focused on preaching the gospel. We um, encourage the, the movement of the spirit and the, the use of the gifts of the spirit. Um, but there are churches that would have none of that. It's all about the ritual. And you need an altar and incense and candles and servers and robes and all of those kind of things. Um, and so we're not saying that we're right and they're wrong. We're just saying this is what where we are. Um, and so this is a process of clarifying that. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking... Um, uh, this last week, we looked at the history of the church. Um, this coming Sunday, we're looking at, we begin looking at the grounds of our faith. Um, and this Sunday, we're looking at the, the scripture and why we hold the scripture in high regard, why that is the basis of our faith. We're then going to look at the creeds of the church, which are what the church over, over time in history has, has said is central to the faith. We will then look at the 39 articles Articles, which is um, was mentioned this last Sunday, and back in the the 1600s became a statement of what Anglicanism stood for. Essentially, putting Anglicanism uh, as distinct from Roman Catholicism, which most people knew. And so, a lot of the 39 articles look at, at what the Catholic Church was teaching at the time, saying that's wrong. We stand here, but it was also trying to avoid the excesses of some of the um, Anabaptist movement coming in from the um, from the continent and so the 39 articles was the only time the Anglican church has come up with a number of statements trying to define what the faith is um, we're then going to look at the following week at uh, the catechism and the prayer books uh, because that has also shaped our faith and if you go back to the prayer book you see that it is scripture rich um, and it hasn't only shaped our faith, but it's shaped the English language. It's shaped English society and English culture. Um, and it's played a, a, an important part in the, the shaping of, of English. Um, and by extension, a lot of the Western world. And so we're hoping as we work through these things that we, we can say this is the, the heritage of faith that we have. Um, and we're drawing on all these bits and pieces to understand where we stand and what we're basing our faith on. So that when we say Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, what do we mean? Why do we say it? Um, and if somebody comes along and says, well, I don't believe that Jesus, that, that um, the Virgin birth actually happened, we can say, well, sorry, at St. Luke's, um, if you're going to preach, if you're going to teach, if you're going to be a Bible study leader or whatever, and you disagree on these points, um, then I'm afraid you're welcome to be part of the parish, but not to lead the parish. Um, and so it really is to help us clarify um, 
our understanding, the parish understanding, and to come to a point where there's an agreement of uh, what we, as St. Luke's, believe. And this week we looked back at our history and how we emerged. And I was interested to hear uh, Jeremy find that there were bishops in England in the year 300 already, um, which was a, a long, long time ago. Um, and as he was saying, sort of the, the fact that the church spread and that could be organized enough that you could have bishops who could go to a church meeting in France um, suggests a high level of organization and a fair deal of sophistication. Um, when you think of what England was like back in the 300s, you had the, the cots and the spit and the pits and the, uh, the various uh, 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 indigenous people in England, and then you had the Roman Empire imposed upon them. Um, and so uh, goes back and says, the church has been in England for a long time. But interestingly, the church, I'm not sure how successfully it supplanted the local religion, because when I went to visit um, some friends in England back in the 1990s, um, I met a couple of people and they're chatting and said, oh, no, they, they don't like the Anglican church. They, they think we, we the whole Christian thing, we need to get back to the old religion. Um, and when they were talking about the old religion, they weren't talking about Roman Catholicism. They were talking about the pre-Christian pagan religions of England. They were talking about the, the, uh, the religion of Druids and uh, Wicca and those kind of things, which are beginning to reemerge in England. And people are more and more interested in that. And you look at, just have to look at what happens at Stonehenge at the summer solstice and the number of people that are there and various people claiming to be wizards or witches or, or whatever, celebrating the Midsummer Festival um, in the traditional way, um, does suggest that uh, superficially, England was a Christian country, but if you went down into the, the, the grassroots, it was probably was fairly um, a mixed bag. And I think it's, it's where the church is around the world very often. And certainly in, in Africa, um, I know from when I was down in the low felt that you'd go to uh, a, a place and there, there'd be a lot of Christian churches and everybody would say, yes, they're Christian. Um, but the, oh, on a Saturday evening in a certain times, people would go and take uh, blood offerings to the um to the cemeteries as part of the traditional religion. Um, and so although people, and it was often people like church wardens, they were good upright Christians on a Sunday, but at other times they, they weren't as clear in their faith. Um, and in South Africa, I think the, uh, uh, the Zionists have got into that, that space of semi-Christian, but keeping a lot of the traditional uh, teachings and traditional religion alive. Um, so the church was in England, um, and it certainly uh, dominated the ruling classes. And as in so much of the world, when the chief becomes Christian or when the chief becomes Buddhist or when the chief becomes Muslim, that's it. Everybody's now Muslim. This is a Muslim village, irrespective of what anybody actually believes. Um, and I think it was probably like that in England as well. Uh, and so the, the, the church slowly grew um, and was part of the life of, of England until the 1500s when everything started changing in Europe. Um, and there's a number of, of good films. There was a, a, a film a couple of about five, ten years ago on Martin Luther. I think it's just called Luther. Um, uh, and well well acted, a good film, looking at some of the, the, the crucial issues that drove Luther in the Reformation. And the, the church, the Roman Catholic Church at the time had become quite uh, dissolute. It was the main power around Europe. It would impose kings and depose kings. Um, and it was not a particularly holy 
church. And if you go through history, um, the number of bishops who ensured that their sons became bishops as well, despite the fact that clergy were supposed to be celibate, <laughs> is quite frightening. Um, and coming out of this uh, Roman Catholic teaching at the, at the time, which was you were saved partially by faith, but what you did added to your, your, your faith. And so you had to do the right thing in order to merit salvation. Um, and so <clears throat> the minute you start something like saying you earn your salvation by your good works and by the way you live and what you do, that becomes problematic. And when you go for a confession and somebody says to be forgiven, you need to go and do something. Now, a lot of Catholic um, today, it would be you need to go and pray, um, which they might say, say X number of Hail Marys, say the Lord's Prayer so many times or whatever. Um, or you may have to go and do a certain amount of good works. But the minute you're having to do things, you end up in the position where you say, if to get into heaven, I need to feed 100 people each week. What if I injure myself and can't do it, but pay someone else to feed the 100 people? Does that still count in my favor? Um, although I'm not doing it myself because I'm paying somebody to do it on my behalf, can that work still be credited to me and be added to my merit? And it's a kind of logical thing, yes, that, that does make sense. Um, and then it's a, a small step from that to saying, well, if you give it the money to the church and they organize the necessary feeding and help and work to be done, and it's get credited to you as your merit, although you're not feeding yourself, you're enabling people to feed, you're enabling the good works to happen. Um, therefore, by paying a certain amount of money to the church, you get merit because of the good works they can do. Um, again, it's an it's a incremental step forward. Yes, that does make sense. That's a sort of, you can understand where it comes from. And then it's a case of, well, now this is what it costs, how much merit you need. And if you, um, and at that point, the, the church started selling indulgences, which really was a, give us a certain amount of money and we will give you a certificate stating that you have X amount of merit and can be, uh, get out of purgatory for free. And it then started becoming, well, you. what about your parents who are dead? Can you afford to leave them in purgatory? Um, because if you, if you give us the money and you state who it's for, the merit can be credited to them. And so you can get your parents or your grandparents out of purgatory and into heaven by buying indulgences. Um, and in the superstitious world, like the medieval world was, a lot of people fell for that. I suspect not many of the educated people, and probably there were no kings rushing with huge amounts of money to buy indulgences. And so it was a way of exploiting the, the poor. Um, and that really got Luther going. Um, and he, studying the scriptures, realized we saved by grace through faith that's it um, and that started the the reformation um, and as a just a side comment it was shortly after this well in the next century or two that the roman catholic church had a a reformation as well and so the roman catholic church that was prevalent in the 15 1600s was quite different from the Roman Catholic Church of, of later years. They, they changed and moved away from some of the worst uh, abuses that were present. But, but in the, Luther started saying, this is it. Um, we're not going to uh, believe the Pope. The Pope's wrong. We're going to start a new church for Germans. We're going to put the Bible in, in, in German so that people can read it. 
Um, and that started the Reformation. If you watch the film of Luther, it gets tied up with the politics of the day um, very well, because there's, there's seldom religion without politics. Um, and it was uh, various kings and princes and uh, power groups using religion for their own ends. Um, and if you look around the world today, not much has changed. And one looks at the situation in America and the religious landscape of the politics um, uh, in America, and you see that religion is being used for power there. When Donald Trump leveraged the, the Christian vote and claimed all sorts of Christian principles, and you look at his life and what he said and how he lived and what he what he did, <laughs> you say there's no ways that any of those um, great Christian leaders would have him in their Sunday school leadership. Um, but he leveraged that and got their support as a politician. Um, and so, yeah, the world is the same as it was 300 years ago. Religion and politics gets mixed up far too easily. Um, as the Reformation began, it then played into the, the, um, the power politics in England, where King Henry um, for uh, sensible reasons wanted a male heir. He had come through, England had been through a period of great civil unrest and wars and fighting. And he thought, well, we've got a fairly stable now. I need a male heir that I can pass the kingdom on to, to maintain this, this order that we have. Um, and the fact that he only had daughters upset the apple cart. And so his motives were not just for his own pleasure. They really were in an almost, um, one might say, noble in their intent. Um, it wasn't just that some other uh, pretty woman had uh, caught his fancy. There were political issues around it. Um, and interestingly, when he wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, who the Pope said, the, the Pope had been quite happy to annul his previous marriages, then said, no, you can't, I'm not going to annul this marriage. It wasn't because the Pope had suddenly decided three annulments was, was more than enough. We're not doing this. It's against scripture or anything. Uh, it just so happened that um, uh, Catherine of Aragon was the niece of King Philip of Spain, who was the most powerful king in Europe. And King Philip of Spain said to the Pope, if you annul my niece's marriage, you're going to be in trouble. And so the Pope, it wasn't anything about what was right and what the Bible said or anything like that. He was looking after his own skin and he thought, no, I'm going to side with King Philip of Spain. He's the most powerful monarch. This funny English upstart, no, I'm not going to help him out at all. Um, and that's why he, uh, the motivation in Philip, in the Pope's uh, uh, world for not uh, allowing the annulment of the marriage. But what it did is it precipitated the movement of the English church out of Roman Catholicism. Um, at that time, there were a number of, of uh, great English reformers that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, were actually working on reshaping the way English, the English understood the faith. And so someone like Thomas Cranmer, although he was Roman Catholic, he was actually working for Reformation um, and wanted to get uh, the church aligned with what is happening in Europe without going the whole way that some of the, the people under uh, Calvin had done in Geneva and without sort of falling to the, the Anabaptists and the, and the Congregationalists who were um, quite extreme in their rejection of uh, the church. And so Cranmer uh, and the king established the Anglican Church as independent with the, the king of England as the uh, uh, temporal head of the church. And that has remained to this day. Uh, queen Elizabeth is officially the head of the Church of England. She's not the head of the Anglican Church. She's the head of the Church of England. Um, and any... Uh, bishop that is appointed, she appoints the bishop. Um, she's reached the point now where 
as with Parliament, she's a figurehead and, and elections will take place and people come forward and say, here is the candidate that we have chosen to be Bishop of Liverpool or whatever. And she really gives it her, her rubber stamp. Although there have been cases in where the, the king or the queen have queried and challenged it, where there's been some debate around the, uh, uh, the episcopacy. And so uh, today the queen is the head of the, of the Church of England in a figurehead role, which is why when, when Prince Philip, not Prince Philip, Prince Charles says he doesn't want to be seen as the defender of the faith, which has been passed on from monarch to monarch from King Henry onwards. But rather he wants to be the defender of faiths or the defender of faiths, which will include all faiths that are present in England. From a political point of view, that kind of makes sense because England is becoming a more and more multicultural society um, and fewer and fewer people would identify as, as Christian, let alone as Anglican and the increasing number of Buddhists and Hindus and, and Muslims and, and other religions in England. And so Prince Charles would like to be the head of, uh, the defender of all those faiths. But what it does is it moves the church and uh, away from where it is, which is clearly um, an Anglican Christian position. And so we will see how that plays out. Um, going forward. I, I suspect there'd be a number of, of Anglican, of the bishops that would um, accept his position, because I think a lot of the Anglican bishops in the West are wanting to be um, open and uh, accepting, uh, though there would be a few that would say, no, that's, that's not the Christian position. We're a Christian church. This is a Christian nation. We stand on the faith which is what we have in the prayer book and the creeds, et cetera. So it'll, I'm not sure how that will play out going forward. But once the uh, Cranmer and King Henry had established the Anglican Church, as J Jerry pointed out, uh, you had Mary, Queen of Scots, then came and took over, became Queen of England, and she executed most of the reformers, a lot of political opponents, and it was quite a a bloody time until King James took over from her upon, uh, sorry, Queen Elizabeth then took over um, and re-established the Protestant Church, Church of England. Mary was eventually executed. And fortunately, Queen Elizabeth had a long reign. She reigned for about 40 years. Um, and she was astute. She was um, a good person and she enabled the church to become fully established. And, and from that point onwards, there was no sort of really going back to um, abandoning the Protestant position of the Church of England. Under uh, James who followed, they had the King James Bible, the authorized version was written. And it's interesting if you read through the preface to the Bible, they're quite clear that everybody that was working on the King James Bible said as they were translating it, that they believed that this was the word of God that they were working with. And so they were very conscious of the fact that um, this was God's word and therefore they had to translate it as best they could um, to convey the meaning clearly in English so that people would know what God had said. Um, jumping forward to today, that's one of the reasons why a number of uh, more conservative churches still say you've, the King James Version is the only acceptable version, because a number of the other translations have had people working on the translating committee that have been really good scholars in terms of ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek and have been able to do the translating in terms of a language really well, but they haven't accepted that this is the inspired word of God. For them, this is an interesting ancient text that they're translating into English as best they can. Um, 
But therefore, a number of people have said, because of that, we're not prepared to use that in church because they haven't been, uh, they haven't been uh, working with God in the translation. They've been ignoring God. Whereas the King James Version, everybody realized they were working with God um, and working together with God in this translating process. The Anglican Prayer Book or the Book of Common Prayer, which was published, and the King James Version of the Bible became this, probably the two books that most English people would have in their possession and could read. Um, and there would be many, many people that the only book they had in the house would be a Bible. And so over the years, many, many people learned to read from the Bible. Um, and the prayer book and that Bible shaped the way English was used. That They had a profound impact on the English language, um, on how we say things, on ideas that we have of um, uh, figures of speech, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, now, whether that was a good thing or not, I think it was a good thing that, that it shaped English thinking as well when that becomes your, your, the primary text that you have to work, work from, that's going to be shape your worldview. It's going to shape your understanding of yourself. And I think that that was a, a very important thing in the Western world going forward. And so as, as England then expanded, um, whether colonialism was good or not, I think it was a, a very mixed bag. The church went out in missionary endeavor without the colonists very often. And you look in, in South Africa and they established mission stations in the Eastern Cape, in Zululand, um, in uh, parts of uh, what was then uh, the Transvaal Republic, um, quite independently of any uh, colonial effort, uh, really wanting to get the gospel to these people. And it wasn't only in Africa. They went to the east, um, and it wasn't only the Anglicans. It was many churches went planting the Christian faith. And the missionaries went out armed with the King James Bible, um, and the Anglican missionaries had the prayer book, and that then started shaping the way English was used in other countries. And as the Bible was became, as missionaries settled in areas, they started translating the Bible into the local languages. And in many instances, the Bible was the first written text in that language. Um, and it was the Bible translations which sort of shaped the way a language was written. Um, and so that had a, a big impact on the wider world. Um, I think once the Church of England was established, it then became part of the establishment. And you look back at some of the, the writing, you know, I think of uh, uh, Pride and Prejudice, where you have uh, people that were ministers in the church, people who were going into the church and becoming ministers, not because they felt any kind of calling, it was just what you did. People went to church because that was the way society worked. Um, and the standard position was your eldest son inherited your estate, your second son went into the military, and your third son went into the church. Um, whether they believed anything or not was neither here nor there. It was just part of society and it was a position of employment. Um, and, and many rich people would endow a parish, and so there's money to pay somebody to preach sermons on a Sunday, and that was it. Um, and then around the, the 18, early 1800s, Charles Wesley and John Wesley began the Wesleyan revival, um, and Whitfield uh, came along as well, and challenged that, that perspective of, of the church. Um, and suddenly, uh, a lot of people were then leaving the Anglican church to join these new churches where people that believed passionately 
in God were preaching and calling people to repentance um, and changing society. And that led to a revival and the church uh, had a bit of a wake up and uh, yeah, it realized it sort of it had to do something differently. Following on from that, the, uh, in the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s, 1900s, you had the Oxford movement, which was a resurgence of uh, Roman Catholic thinking in the Anglican Church. Um, and it came out of a perspective where the Anglican Church was all but dead. The Methodist Church um, was, was uh, doing well but it was a very working class church and a lot of people in the uh, upper classes were not attracted to it. Um, and people thought, what was there that we could do that would make the church seem uh, uh, relevant to people? And they started saying, we need to do uh, some of those rituals and get people involved in that. Um, and so ritualism was reintroduced into the church. Um, and people started changing, uh, taking from Roman Catholicism and using it in the Anglican Church as well. Um, and so the Roman Catholic influence and the high church influence of incense and uh, bells and robes, etc., was not part of the historic Anglican Church. That came about in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and I'd have to check the details, but as far as I know, somebody said that the first Anglican bishop to put on a mitre was only in the 1900s. And so those things which we think are part of Anglicanism are actually quite recent additions. And the church has grown. Uh, I think in the 70s, we had the renewal movement come in the, the, with uh, the Pentecostal influence and the charismatic movement. Um, and people realizing that we need to call people to faith. We need to pray for people to be filled with the spirit. We need people to um, minister and to live a spiritual life. And I think that sort of ends up where we are today. Right. Um, are there questions people might have on the um, what was said on Sunday? Sunday or what I've said um, at the moment. Any thoughts, questions, anything that's not clear? Anything that I've got wrong? Because uh, Jerry was the one that researched the sermon, not me. Um, so. Uh, can I make one comment? Um, yes, certainly. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm not going to quibble about detail. What is of interest to um, the Church of the Province of, of, of Southern Africa is that it was um, its roots, its religious roots are, hmm. are very much from uh, one side of the Anglican Church uh, with a Catholic influence called the... Sorry, Barry, we've, we've lost you. We got um, the, 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 the Angli Church of the Province, the Anglican Church of South Africa began with a very Catholic influence. And Barry's vanished. Yeah, I think he's vanished. I, I think that, that's entirely true. Um, there were two streams of, 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 of uh, missionary endeavor. The one came from... Uh, the uh, the evangelical wing of the church, the the, the more Bible believing side of things, and other missionaries came from the high church side. Um, to and so you had both elements in South Africa, um, and uh, uh, some of the Natal missionaries were more uh, evangelical. And so some of the, the bishops that were working in Natal didn't see eye to eye with the bishops in Cape Town. When Robert Gray came as the first bishop of Cape Town, 
he was a very high church bishop. Um, and he brought, he brought that with him uh, mm -hmm. into the Anglican church. And there were a number of parishes in Cape Town that were not high church and that disagreed with him. And so you've got the, the St. John's Weinberg and a number of other churches in Cape Town. I think St. John's Christ Church Kenilworth, Church of the Holy Spirit in Kloof, uh, not in Kloof, in uh, yeah, one, of, one of the suburbs is a church in Plumstead. There's a whole group of churches that have agreed to be part of the Anglican Church in South Africa, but with a measure of independence because they didn't agree with um, the position that uh, Robert Gray took and they, they uh, didn't want to have him as their bishop. And so there was an, an accommodation made and they still have that independence in Cape Town at the moment. But that's right. The uh, because Robert Gray was was high church, it ended up with a very high church influence. And one looks at, at uh, uh, Johannesburg, which also had a, a high church background, and groups like the Community of the Res Resurrection, which came to the mining town of Johannesburg to start mission work amongst the the, the miners. They came out of the, uh, the that Anglo-Catholic wing. And they came with their robes and their incense and and everything, um, and they had a, it was them that that got St. St. John's College going, which is why St. John's ends up being such a high church um, uh, school. Uh, it's the, the heritage of the community of the resurrection, um, and so yes. The, and interestingly, if you go into the rest of Africa. East Africa was, was much more low church, um, much more evangelistic and evangelical, um, and likewise some of West Africa. Um, and so today, the Anglican church in South Africa is struggling. Uh, if you look around the rest of the continent, often it's thriving. And I had a friend that went to, um, to the church in Kenya, and the bishop there was saying, if the people can have a tavern every 800 meters along a road, which is more or less what it was. There's no reason why we can't have a church, an Anglican church, every three kilometers along a road. And that's what they were working towards establishing. Um, and this friend said they were planting churches and there would be 100 people gathering in a, in a hall somewhere and raising money, getting together to build churches. Um, and it is a very dynamic uh, church. And so, yeah, South African Anglicanism was far more high church and ceremonial. A lot of the rest of Africa was low church and evangelistic. Um, right. So that so makes, makes us wonder what we are. You know, it's quite, quite confusing. What are we? What do we believe? Uh, yeah, well, um, what informs the, the, the study is um, the fundamentals. And if I, I went to the, when clergy are ordained and when they are put in charge of a parish, they sign an oath of canonical obedience, saying we will toe the line, we will obey the canons, and we will obey the bishop if, um, if what he's doing is lawful. And there's then a declaration, um, which are copied. This is the declaration that the clergy read. Um, that I, Ian David Stevens, now about to be admitted as rector, do sol solemnly make the following declaration. I declare my belief in the faith, which is uniquely revealed in the Holy Scriptures, held by the primitive church, summed up in the creeds, and affirmed by the undisputed general councils, to which the 39 articles of religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons bear witness. I affirm my loyalty to this inheritance of faith as my inspiration and guidance under God 
in bringing the grace and truth of Christ to this generation, making him known to those in my care. And so officially, the church is all over the, well, not officially, practically, the church is all over the show. Officially, that's where we stand. On the Holy Scriptures, um, the faith held by the primitive church, which is the, the early church of the first, second, third century, summed up in the creeds, which we're going to be looking at, the, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed, affirmed by the undisputed general councils. There were a number of councils, which is where all the bishops of the church came together, um, uh, and they produced things like the creeds and debated uh, and discussed what the faith actually was. Um, and the last general council was in the late, about the year 900, because shortly after that, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church split away from the, uh, the Western Church. And that was, there were no, no further general councils. You then had Eastern and Western councils, but those were then divided. The 39 articles, which again is a statement of faith, the Book of Common Prayer and ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons were the original um, Anglican service books uh, because they had the Book of Common Prayer and then they said we need uh, service to uh, ordain priests and consecrate bishops. And the, they made one which went together with uh, the Book of Common Prayer. And that's what we look back to. So what do we believe? Officially, that's what we believe. Um, and so we're going to be looking at what that actually is. Um, and so when uh, people come and say, oh, well, as Anglicans, we, I just look at them and say, no, as Anglicans, we don't. <laughs> because, uh, uh, and you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, the Anglicans are the middle way. And so we, we don't take the extreme. No, so where does it say we're the middle way? That's what you think. Um, and people talk about, oh, the, uh, you, and you'll probably hear, I have heard, and we'll, we'll mention it going in the talks, uh, the three, three uh, uh, sources of Anglican theology, which is the scripture, tradition, and reason, um, which is a nice idea, which was in, introduced by um, Bishop Hooker a couple of centuries ago, but has never been official. And nowhere in any of the declarations of the Anglican Church is that said, yes, this is what the Anglican Church believes. Um, people might accept that, but it's not a statement that is generally accepted. And even that is, is completely uh, debatable. As the scripture is clear, it's the Bible, tradition, and people sometimes think tradition is what the church has done over the years. And other people say, no, when that statement was written, the tradition of the church was the creeds and the statements of those undisputed general counsel, because they're not part of scripture. But the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, Athanasian Creed, which we believe, the statement of faith of God as a trinity, not in scripture, but that is what um, the general councils decreed. That's what the, the tradition is. Sorry, not sorry, what the yeah, church... what, what's, what's not in, sorry, what did you say? It's not, not in what? Not in the Bible. The the the. the, the, the definition of the holy trinity god is trinity three persons one god um is is the bible talks clearly about god the father talks clearly about jesus as god talks clearly about the spirit of god being god um and so the church later drew those ideas together and formulated the doctrine of the trinity mm. uh, as the way to understand these ideas um, and that is part of the debate was jesus actually god or was he just human was jesus fully god um or was he fully man and to get to the position well he's actually both and is he part of the god is he sub sub, mis, sub uh, subservient to god or not and it, it, the, the council end up no the trinity is um he is fully god god the father's fully god the spirit's fully god but those that's no way in scripture itself that is part of the, wow. the way the church made sense of, of the teaching of scripture um, and formulated that doctrine, likewise with the creeds. Um, and so when we talk about the tradition of the church, that's what they're referring to. We're not referring to 
the fact that we that the church in South Africa has candles on the altar and seven servers leading the the priest in in his fine um, ecclesiastical finery. That's not that's not the tradition we refer to, but that's often what people think. They say, "Oh, the church has moved, and what the church teaches today is part of the tradition." No, that's not. That that's the church's going off the rails today. Tradition is what was defined by those general councils back in the day, and when it comes to reason. Again, it's, it's saying that it's not what I think, and the world today would generally say, my reason, what I think is sensible today, um, therefore, because I think it's sensible, that has authority. As Anglicans, I believe in scripture, tradition, and reason, and in my reason, I think this. That's not at all what it means. It means that uh, the, 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 the uh, historical church used reason, and that's how they came to the, the creeds and the affirmation. They they looked at what scripture taught. They looked at what the primitive church believed. And using reason, interrogating, thinking it through, debating it, came to the formulations um, that we have established um, in the church. And so, um, yeah. Uh, but, but that notion of scripture, tradition, and reason is possibly useful. Um, but it's not official and it never has been. Uh, the official is the scripture, the creeds, 39 articles in the book of common prayer. Um, and so if anybody, any Anglican wants to contest it, we could say, show us <laughs> your official documents because um, I can show you my official documents which say this is what we believe um, and that's what, where we stand. Um, Yen, yes. Uh, I found I, I, I'm, I'm actually I'm battling with this teaching on 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 some level. Um, okay. And the reason why I battle with it is that I see the significance of the church in. Sorry, I see my my face is not up, and I can't tell why. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, I think mainly because I see the significance of the church in helping us really understand our faith. In, so in a sense, helping us to understand, to believe uh, and clearly defining that. Mm. I also see the significance of the church in helping us define more what the church of God is. So in terms of belonging, yeah. what I battle with, with the church is helping us to become more like who God intended us to be in the world as his children. And why I battle with that is how the church has behaved in, in time and how it's, it's manifested itself in time and mm. how it has not evolved itself to actually really truly resemble that which our faith is expecting it to actually resemble. Mm. And that's where, for me, the difficulty in, I guess, embracing Anglicism or Catholicism <laughs> or whatever, for me, it almost becomes superficial mm. because it's not that I'm not taking into account its relevance and its importance in shaping issues of faith. Mm. But what I'm battling with, it's, you know, this was mainly a political, there, there was a political maneuvering and all sorts of things. And I'm like, what's that got to do with God and, and Jesus and, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible? And that's wow. where I think, you know, I'm battling with this conversation a bit because mm. when I look at the church and, and the Anglican and Catholic church, I think there are crimes here that are heinous that mm. have still not been accounted for. And I actually don't want anything like that to be associated with my faith with God. I yeah. think that's somebody else's problem, not mine. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm just kind of trying to reconcile all of this. This is what's going on in my head. Um, yeah. And I just hope somehow we, we reconcile that kind of, uh, yeah. I don't know if my, my thought process makes sense, but I, I'm back here with that. Absolutely. And I think... I sort of time and again I say to people don't judge the religion by what the church does because the church mm -hmm. is often way off the mark um, and if people look at the church and say oh you 
Christians who say, no, 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 no this is the church people. True Christians live differently. Um, mm. I, I take comfort from the fact that um, if you go back to read the Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the church was in a mess. <laughs> and people <laughs> were divided and people were, were getting the things wrong. Um, and he had to write and, to, and correct it and say, you can't do this, you need to do that, and you, you're divided, and the, you're, the rich are taking advantage of people, and that's not right. Um, and, the whole, and so I look at that and I think, right from the, the beginning, from the get-go, the devil's been in there me messing things up because that's what, what the devil does. And so mm -hmm. for the last 2,000 years, the church has always been a, a bit of a compromise between what it could be as the body of Christ and what it ends up being as an organization in the world. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's been a, a problem area all along. I think the, the other thing that, that I take com comfort from as well is when you look back to um, uh, some of the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where they look and they say, um, inspired by God, saying, I'm going to come, I'm going to trash the city, I'm going to destroy everything, I'm bringing my servant, um, Nebuchadnezzar, to exercise my judgment on the mm. people. And he talks about these foreign pagan kings as his servants. He was using them to achieve his purposes. They were not Jewish. They did not believe in God. They didn't believe in the God of, of the Jews. They were on their own mission. They were not weren't thinking, I'm doing God's work. They're thinking, I'm expand, expanding my, my territory. I'm getting making myself richer and grander, etc. But God used them nonetheless. Um, and people could look back and say that was God's judgment on Israel at that time. Mm. And so when the church <laughs> behaves like the church does and does all of these things, I say, Thankfully, we have a God who's bigger than people and can actually work through those, those fallen people. And so when bishops are maneuvering to try and exercise political opinion and gain influence and, and gain power um, in their own ways with their own agenda, God can use that nonetheless. Not that what they're doing is right, but despite what they're doing, God can work. God is bigger than than them, um, and so I look at, I look at, at all of those things, and, and one looks at something like um, the way the church was co-opted by colonialism, and uh, often embraced colonialism and came with with a, a closed mindset to impose not just religion but the whole culture, um, and that was was hugely problematic. But when looks and say, says, under that, people got to find God, got to know God. And maybe what the church needs to do is to roll back some of those um, structures that were imposed and say, hold on a minute, we, 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 we didn't just give you religion, we gave you religion plus Western culture. Unburden yourself of the Western culture, hang on to the religion. Um, and again, the, the, that would be part of where I'm looking at Anglicanism, because if you, you look at sort of the 39 articles, you look at all the teachings, um, they're not specifically Western. They, they, they could fit in, the, they hold no um, uh, specific cultural baggage to them. I think they're co-opted by culture, but they could be culture free. Um, but they weren't, but they could be. And so to have that, that fundamental, this is the, the faith of the, the scripture, the creeds, the basics of the faith. The rest that we have as part of the church of what we dress and the way we sing and the candles and the, the structures and the hierarchy and the, all that kind of stuff, that is an add-on, but that's not the fundamental. Um, and we can get rid of all those add-ons. And, and you can go to a, the, the church in China and look at the way they structure. You can go and look at the church in um, Korea, which operates quite differently, and look at what, what they've got as the fundamentals. And so we can do the same kind of thing. Um, and so uh, and I think the problem with Anglicanism is a lot of the cultural trappings have been 
defined as what the church is. And I can remember years back as a student going to a mission station in um, Kambula in Zululand, and they had a chapel there. And I went into the chapel, and it was this little English country church stuck in the middle of Zululand. I looked at it and I thought, what were the people thinking? But this was the high church people coming in with, it was the high church way of doing things. And I thought, this, this is completely culturally foreign to the people. And you've imposed uh, pews and aisles and little uh, narrow windows on the side. And all of these things, that's culture. That's not the faith. Um, and, to get rid of, and to get rid of that is, is challenging. There's a, a wonderful church that the, the Roman Catholics built in the Bronco Sprite, where they, they built a big church, and it's round like a, like a rondavo. Um, and they've, they've gone and said, this is Africa. We build an African church. And it's, it's a wonderful church. It um, has a, a very, very strong African feel to it. Um, but those, those, those kind of things are few and far between. And maybe that's what we need to get to. So, so I don't know if that helped, if that answered in any way or, or just made matters worse. No, thank Ian, you can very I come much, in with a couple Ian, of things? That. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I've, heard, yes. I've heard the Anglican Church described as the Tory party at prayer. Yes. Yeah. But I, on a, seriously, one thing that's missing from our prayer book is the 39 art. Articles. Mm. And I would like to suggest that you make a, an, a, a copy of the 39 articles available to anybody who wants it. Um, can, watch, the, watch the space when you come to talking about the 39 articles. Yeah, because we'll I, think, them out. I think we really, because I won't tell you some of the things I've heard Anglican priests saying about that. <laughs> I'm going to tell you privately sometime. But oh. I think it would be good for us to have. The mm, thirty-nine yeah. articles to read. Yeah, if you go, go back, if you go back to, to go back to the Book to of Wesley's, Common. There's a yeah. lovely story about John Wesley's mother. She had a family of nineteen, and she was a busy lady. And the kids knew that when mother was sitting by the fire in the kitchen with her apron over her head, she'd gone to mm. church. She was with God. And when mother was sitting there with an apron over her head, nobody disturbed her because that was her time with God. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Now, when we come to talking about the 39 articles, we're certainly going to give copies to everybody. Um, no reason why only the clergy should be confused. We need to spread it around. <laughs> so, no, we'll, we'll do that. And likewise, things like the Athanasian Creed as well. Um, yeah, it's a bit. It's a bit verbose. It used to be in the prayer book, mm -hmm. and I think uh, officially, I think that it had to be used on one or two of the the, the great feasts of the church. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's long, which which it is, um, it got used less and less and dropped out, um, and so has fallen into disuse. But no, we'll we'll definitely as we go through all those things that we were talking about. Uh, we will give copies to people so that uh, people at least have the the official heritage of the Anglican Church in their hands going forward. So, right. Thank you for being here. I had thought of looking at the, well, let me just do that very, very briefly um, from Matthew 28, which was a gospel Jerry used on Sunday. Um, the Great Commission from verse 16, when the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, they, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I think um, as one looks at that, you see Jesus commissioning Christians to go and make disciples. Um, and the Anglican Church has done that, not necessarily well, um, not necessarily consistently, but that has been part of the Anglican heritage, um, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So we have this, this practice of um, uh, the sacraments, baptism, and the teaching of what Jesus has commanded. Um, and the, again, over the years, the church has uh, done that, possibly in fits and starts, and not always well. But as I look back over history, I just thank God that God has had his hand <laughs> in it, despite the people that have been involved. Um, and the church has survived, and the church is here, and we do continue, and we still have that commission to, to spread the good news, to make disciples, to call people to the, the teachings of Christ. Um, and no doubt in a century or two, people will look back at what we've been doing and think, my goodness, what were they? They think, why did they do that? What, what a disaster. <laughs> uh, but we, 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 we trust that God it will work nonetheless. Um, and that God will work his purposes out despite us. Um, and that God will graciously work through us in the conversations we have with people, in the, the things we say, in what we do, in the invitations we give to people, that in that God will be working um, and that his kingdom will spread. And it... Um, one thinks of this, the parables that Jesus told of the sowing of the seed, where you sow the seed and, <clears throat> and it grows. You don't know how it grows, but it does. <laughs> and, and God brings that growth. And so we, we just pray that the church um, will get back to doing what it's, what it's called to do. And that we, as we do this, will we'll, we'll have a sense of God's call on us and be reminded of the mandate we've been given and the faith that we have in the world that needs it so badly. Mm. Amen. So let us close with a prayer. Our Lord Jesus, as we look back over centuries of the Christian faith, um, we end up being amazed that we are meeting and talking about you at all, that people didn't drop the ball completely and that the whole thing didn't get lost. But we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign and that it is your kingdom, it is your family, it is your gospel, and that you will ensure that it spreads. And we thank you that you do not need huge numbers, but you can work through a remnant. And so many times over the ages, that is what you've done. One or two faithful people, a small group of faithful people, um, looking to you, trusting in you as wanting to, your gospel to spread, speaking about you, have made a huge difference. And so, Lord, we pray that as we go forward, that you would help us to remain faithful to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and we pray that as a church, you would help us to um, align ourselves with you and your purposes and your kingdom so that all that we do will be used to glorify you, to grow your kingdom, and to exalt your name. Jesus, we ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.